Do you ever feel like you're standing on shaky ground? Have you ever wondered where mountains come from? These are some of the questions we'll explore on the Rock and World of Geology Program 5. Believe it or not, the ground below your feet is constantly changing. We'll take a look at the crash and crunch factors that build mountains and keep things shaking. You'll learn about seismic waves, plate tectonics, continental drift, and much, much more. Here's your pop quiz question. You be the judge. A geologist discovers evidence of tensional faulting in northern Candyland. Does this tell her that mountains could or couldn't occur in this geological environment? We'll give you the answer after the show. The Standard Deviants present The Rockin' World of Geology Starring Brad Aldous Galila Azrez Herschel Bleefeld Jeremy Clavin Tessa Monroe, Dana Rubinson, Gabrielle Smith, Malcolm Smith, Shannon Ward, and Jazz Mastin. Like people, when rocks break in reaction to stress, we call it a fracture. Fractures represent a different reaction to stress. Rather than bending and forming folds, some rocks just break apart. Like we said earlier, the rocks near the Earth's surface are especially likely to break when exposed to stress. Rocks that aren't deeply buried are more brittle because they're not exposed to as much heat and pressure as the deeper rocks. Heat and pressure make rocks more bendable. Rocks break more easily at weak spots, like along tiny cracks. There are two types of fractures, joints and faults. As we said earlier, faulting can contribute to mountain building. We'll explain more about that as we go along. Joints are fractures along which no movement occurs. The rock is fractured, but the two separated parts of the rock aren't moving and scraping against each other. Faults are fractures in which the two separated sections of rock move and scrape against each other. When one side of a fault moves considerably higher than the other, it can form a mountain. Now let's go over the anatomy of a fault. The fault plane is the actual site of the fracture. It's the plane that forms where the rock splits and separates into two pieces. In this diagram, the fault plane is diagonal. The piece of the rock that lies under the fault plane is called the foot wall block. The piece of rock that lies on top of the fault plane is called the hanging wall block. That's not hard to remember. The foot wall block is under the fault plane, just like your feet are underneath you. The hanging wall block is hanging over the fault plane. No sweat. The terms strike and dip apply to faults too. Again, strike and dip are rock geometry. They are measurements that describe the orientation of the fault. The strike of the fault plane is the direction of the line formed where the fault plane intersects a horizontal surface. It's just like measuring the strike of a rock bed. There's no water in this diagram, so we'll draw in an imaginary horizontal plane. See the direction of the line formed where the fault plane meets the horizontal plane? The direction of that line is the strike of the fault. The dip is the measurement of the angle of the fault relative to a horizontal plane. We measure the dip of the fault the same way we measure the dip of an inclined rock bed. Again, the dip angle is measured from an imaginary line running perpendicular to the direction of the strike of the fault. Once again, the strike of a fault is the direction of the line formed where the fault plane meets a horizontal plane. The dip of the fault is the measurement of the angle at which the fault meets a horizontal plane. These terms describe the orientation of faults. Now we'll talk about two categories of faults. Dip-slip faults and strike-slip faults. In a dip-slip fault, 
one side of the fault moves up or down relative to the other side. All movement of a dip-slip fault is parallel to the dip of the fault plane. In other words, the moving side will slide up or down parallel to the fault plane. If the fault plane is at an angle, the moving side will move up or down along the fault plane at that same angle. In this diagram, it looks like the hanging wall block, the side on top of the fault plane, slid downward relative to the foot wall block, the side under the fault plane. Faults that have this type of movement are called normal faults. Normal faults are usually the result of the sections of rock moving away from each other. A reverse fault can occur when rocks are compressed. Under the stress of compression, the hanging wall block will often move up relative to the foot wall block rather than down as in the case of a normal fault. Dip-slip faults can be either normal or reverse faults, depending on whether the hanging wall block moves up or down in relation to the foot wall block. So remember, in a normal fault, the hanging wall block moves down in relation to the foot wall block. In a reverse fault, the hanging wall block moves up in relation to the foot wall block. Normal, down, reverse, up. Normal, down, reverse, up. A thrust fault is a type of reverse fault. The fault plane of a thrust fault lies at a low angle in relation to the horizontal plane. Really, a thrust fault is just a gently inclined reverse fault. The dip angle of a thrust fault is tight, less than 45 degrees. The hanging wall block looks like it's been thrust up over the foot wall block. That's easy to remember. Now you know what the dip-slip faults are. Here's the scoop on strike-slip faults. In a strike-slip fault, the sections of rock slide sideways past each other. We're talking about lateral movement now instead of vertical movement. All movement in a strike-slip fault is parallel to the strike of the fault plane. Remember, the strike is the direction of the line formed where the fault plane meets a horizontal plane. The moving side or sides of a strike-slip fault move parallel to the line formed by the strike. In other words, strike-slip faults slip along the strike. Strike-slip faults slip along the strike. strike slip 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 along. Oblique slip faults combine the movement of dip-slip and strike-slip faults. They move diagonally along the fault plane, having both a vertical and horizontal component. Sideways and up, baby. Remember plutons? No, 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 no. I said pluton, not futon, right? Plutons are hardened chunks of magma that cool beneath the Earth's surface. When the soil and softer rock around a giant pluton, or batholith, erodes away and leaves a huge erosion-resistant chunk sticking up out of the ground, presto, you have a mountain. Well, not presto, really. The, the process takes a really long time. But the point is, some mountains, like the Sierra Nevadas in California and Nevada, are exposed plutons. Continental plate movement can cause magma to move upward toward the crust. Not only are some mountains exposed plutons, moving continental plates that form mountains and volcanoes also form plutons. The processes go hand in hand. A really big, intense event that causes mountain building is called an orogeny. There are a couple of places on Earth where this form of mountain building is still going on. The Alpine Himalayan Orogenic Belt and the Circumpacific Orogenic Belt are currently experiencing mountain building. In these areas, the tectonic plates are crunching up against each other. Plate movement causes serious deformation. But by and large, the movement is too slow for us to notice much change in our lifetimes. Right now, India is moving northward toward Asia at a rate of about 5 centimeters per year. But between 40 and 50 million years ago, geologists estimate that India was moving northward at about 10 to 15 centimeters per year. This amount of movement may seem almost insignificant but it is responsible for the Himalayas. Part 3, the Earth's Interior and Plate Tectonics. Section A, Seismology and the Earth's Interior. When the Earth cuts loose with some big release of energy, like movement along a fault, it can cause an earthquake. According to the elastic rebound theory, when rocks get stressed enough, they're likely to rupture quickly, like a rubber band breaking. The stress pulls and pulls, and the rocks take all they can until they rupture. 
The energy released from the rupture moves outward in waves from the rupture site. The point within the Earth where the fault rupture starts is called the focus of the earthquake. The energy released by the earthquake emanates in all directions from the focus. The epicenter of the quake is the point on the Earth's surface directly above the focus. The energy waves released by the quake are called seismic waves. Seismic waves come in different types and sizes. Two different types of waves emitted by an earthquake are body waves and surface waves. Body waves travel through the Earth in an accordion-like push-pull sort of oscillation. Surface waves ripple along the surface of the Earth and are similar to the rolling motion of ocean waves. Seismographs record the seismic waves generated by earthquakes. Geologists monitor earthquakes by setting up seismograph stations at strategic areas on the Earth. When an earthquake occurs, the waves travel through the Earth and are received by the seismograph. The first body waves to arrive at a seismograph after an earthquake are called the P waves or primary waves. P waves are body waves that travel through solid, rock, liquid, or gas at a speed of about 5 kilometers or 3.06 miles per second. These waves aren't fooling around. P waves are also called compressional waves because they expand and contract the material they're traveling through with a push-pull motion. S waves, or secondary waves, are the next body waves to shake up the seismograph. Remember, body waves travel through the Earth. S waves are not only slower than P waves, but they can only travel through solid material. When they meet a liquid, they basically just conk out. S waves are called shear waves because these waves cause rock to vibrate at right angles to the direction in which the wave is traveling. The vibration causes a sideways shaking motion. Liquids and gases can't support this shaking. That's why S waves can't travel through liquid or gas. The two most important types of surface waves are called Rayleigh waves, or R waves, and Love waves, or L waves. Remember, surface waves travel along the surface of the Earth rather than through it. Rayleigh waves, or R waves, ripple along the surface of the Earth, rolling forward in an elliptical or oval-shaped path, much like the way ocean waves travel over the surface of the ocean. Love waves, or L waves, travel more quickly than R waves. Love waves are not very loving at all. In fact, they're pretty indestructive. As an L wave moves forward, the ground it's traveling over moves horizontally from side to side in a sort of serpentine path. Seismologists use two measurements to indicate the strength of an earthquake, intensity and magnitude. Intensity refers to how much damage the quake caused. There's a scale that rates intensity called the modified Mercalli scale. Magnitude measures the amount of energy released by the quake and is measured on a scale you've probably heard of called the Richter scale. We'll tell you more about each of these scales. The Richter magnitude scale measures the ground movement at the earthquake's focus. You know, the place where the fault rupture starts. Of course, there's not usually a seismograph conveniently stationed right at the location of the focus. The magnitude registered by the seismograph is adjusted to allow for its distance from the focus. In other words, the Richter scale measurement reflects the energy released at the focus even though the measurement device itself is not located at the focus. The amount of energy released at the focus is the earthquake's magnitude. Using a base 10 logarithmic system, the Richter scale converts the intensity of seismic waves into a numerical value. Let's skip the mathematical mumbo jumbo and get right to what that means. The scale starts at one. Each consecutive increasing number in the scale indicates an earthquake that releases about 30 times more energy than the earthquake which ranks one number lower. The increase from one number to the next on the scale is exponential. For example, an earthquake that registers 5 on the Richter scale releases about 30 times more energy than an earthquake that registers 4, and it releases about 30 squared or 900 times more energy than an earthquake that registers three. Whoa, that's a lot of shaking. Well, technically the Richter scale is open-ended. In other words, 
the numbers can go on up to infinity. But the largest earthquake magnitude recorded is 8.6 on the Richter scale. And it's not likely there will be an earthquake that hits 9, because rocks don't store enough energy to let loose anything that big. That whopping 8.6-er occurred in Alaska in 1964. Intensity is the other factor seismologists take into account when evaluating the strength of an earthquake. I'm thinking about quaking, but I don't know, man. Maybe just a shiver. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna quake. Are you listening to me? I'm gonna do it. Ah! The modified Mercalli scale measures an earthquake's intensity by ranking the damage it does to people and property. The modified Mercalli scale measures an earthquake intensity by ranking the damage it does to people and property, to people and property, to people and property. The Mercalli scale assigns numbers to the entire area affected by the quake. Areas that suffer less damage get a lower Mercalli number, and areas that are severely wrecked get high numbers. High Mercalli numbers roughly coincide with the epicenter of the quake. Remember, the epicenter is the place on the Earth's surface that's right over the focus, where the earthquake starts. This scale can help indicate which buildings and construction methods hold up best against earthquakes. Believe it or not, we've actually gotten one benefit from earthquakes. Seismographic records provide a lot of information about the Earth's interior. Tracking seismic waves from an earthquake's focus to various locations around the globe allows geologists to study how waves travel through the Earth. How the waves travel gives an indication about the composition of the Earth's core. Geologists found that following an earthquake, some of the P waves that had to pass through the Earth's core arrived at the other side much more slowly than they had predicted, and some never arrived at all. What's more, they found that the S waves were completely blocked by the core. You know that S waves can only travel through solid material. Now, if the S waves can't go through the Earth's core, what do you think that suggests? Uh, I don't know. If S waves can't get through the Earth's core, what does that suggest? I don't know. Part of the Earth's core might be liquid. Yes! Thank you! The P waves, on the other hand, aren't completely blocked at the core, but they lose energy and get deflected at a depth of 2,900 kilometers or 1,800 miles. This is the depth of the core mantle boundary, where the layer of the Earth called the mantle ends and the layer called the outer core begins. P waves don't travel as well through the core as they do through the more shallow materials. So P waves also indicate that the core has a different composition than the mantle. Pretty cool, eh? Here's the current model for the interior of the Earth. Geologists believe that the innermost part of the Earth, called the inner core, is a solid ball consisting mostly of iron, perhaps mixed with some nickel, forming an iron-nickel alloy. The outer core is the part that scientists think is liquid. It also consists largely of iron, but it may also have some sulfur, maybe some silicon, and there might be small amounts of nickel and potassium. Scientists believe that the inner core probably used to be liquid too, but it is cooled and crystallized. The mantle has three sections. The lower mantle, the asthenosphere, the upper mantle, and the Mickey mantle. <laughs> Just kidding. The bulk composition of the mantle is mafic. That is, silicate minerals that are rich in iron and magnesium. Seismic waves travel rapidly through the upper and lower mantle, but they slow down considerably at the depth of the asthenosphere. That's because the rocks in the asthenosphere are close to their melting point, and some are probably even molten. Therefore, they're more pliable. Seismic waves cruise through the upper mantle, they go faster through it than they do through the layer above the mantle, called the crust. The boundary that separates the upper mantle from the crust is called the Mohorovicic discontinuity, or just the MOHO. The MOHO is determined by a sharp increase in the velocity of P waves. The crust, the MOHO, and the upper mantle are part of a region of brittle rock called the lithosphere. Section B. 
plate tectonics. We've talked a little already about continental plates and the idea that they move and bump into each other, causing volcanoes and earthquakes and fun. Oh, I'm sorry, potentially deadly stuff like that. This is because, by nature, plates are rude. Come on, move it They over. will make no effort whatsoever on, to accommodate each other. Give me some space, man. Let's go into more detail Come now on, about it. the theory of plate tectonics. In 1915, a German meteorologist named Alfred Wegener developed the idea that all the continents were once joined together in a single giant landmass that broke apart, allowing the continents to drift away from each other. This large-scale movement of continents is called the continental drift. Wegener proposed that a supercontinent once existed that contained all Earth's land masses joined together in one giant hunk of land. Wow! He called the supercontinent Pangea. The way the continents clearly fit together, along with the remarkable similarity of rocks, geologic structures, and fossils on opposite sides of the Atlantic, provided Wegener with enough evidence to get the attention of the scientific community. Some experts vehemently opposed Wegener's hypothesis, but many supported him. Stop continental drift! Stop continental drift! A third faction simply used the conferences about Wegener's theory as an excuse to have big parties. Later, when plate tectonics became accepted by all geologists, these party people claimed that they had supported Wegener the whole time, but had better things to do than argue with a bunch of boneheads about some stupid rocks. But the geologists were partying in a house made of sticks. The owner of the house, Little Pig Number 2, declined to comment. The city of Sandusky, Ohio, for its part in the event, erected a limestone pillar on the site, which later crumbled in a rainstorm and washed away. Geologists continue to study continental plates, and modern science generally accepts the theory of plate tectonics. In fact, plate tectonics revolutionized the science of geology. The theory provides a framework for better understanding of earthquakes, volcanoes, mountain ranges, rock types, and ore deposits on this dynamic planet we call Earth. In the theory of plate tectonics, the lithosphere, which you remember, consists of the upper mantle and the crust, is subdivided into about a dozen lithospheric plates. These plates can slide around as distinct units until they break or buckle at their boundaries. The plates move around on the asthenosphere. The rocks in the asthenosphere are not brittle and hard like the rocks in the lithosphere. The hot, sometimes flowing rock of the asthenosphere provides a skating rink of sorts for the lithospheric plates. I know what you're thinking. What the heck kind of force would it take to move a continent? In the 1950s, Harry Hess of Princeton University came up with a theory about that. It's called the theory of seafloor spreading. See, there are volcanic ridges in the ocean that erupt frequently. There's an especially large volcanic ridge called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge running right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. As these undersea volcanoes cough up new lava, they form new crust, you know, new seafloor. As new seafloor forms, the older seafloor gets shoved sideways. This force is persistent and formidable enough to move continents. Mm. As the plates slide around, they can move away from each other, bump into each other, or slide past each other. Naturally, there are special terms for these plate interactions, and you have to learn them. A plate boundary is a division between two plates. There are three distinct types of plate boundaries. Divergent boundaries, convergent boundaries, and transform boundaries. The first type, divergent boundaries, occur where plates move away from each other. At the mid-Atlantic ridge, where the volcanic action is causing seafloor spreading, the plates on either side of the ridge are moving away from each other. So the boundary between the plates is a divergent boundary. Hey, where are you going? Come back here. No can do, baby. We have a divergent boundary between us. You go your way, and I'll go mine. Breaking up is hard to do. Convergent boundaries, on the other hand, occur where plates collide. Two plates are colliding between India and Eurasia. What happens when continents collide or move away from each other? Mountains, faults, deep sea trenches, chains of volcanic islands, deep seated earthquakes. And here we have the two ships that pass in the night. 
Transform boundaries occur at transform faults where the plates slide sideways past each other. One plate slides laterally in one direction, and the other plate slides laterally in the opposite direction. The San Andreas Fault is a famous transform fault, which runs through California, separating the North American plate from the Pacific plate. Etched in stone. Okay, here it goes. A strike slip fault occurs when a baseball player swings too hard, slips, and misses the ball. Hold on, that's not right. New stone. In a strike slip fault, sections of rock slide sideways past each other along the strike. Ah, much better. Etched in stone. It's time for the answer to the pop quiz. If a geologist discovers evidence of tensional faulting in northern Candyland, it would tell her that mountains could occur in that geological environment. Nice work if you got that right. <laughs>